Hello, 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 and welcome to Walking Through the Word. I am Pastor Keisha with Awaken Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and we're so glad that you're tuning in. Come on in the room, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook. We're about to continue our walk through the book of Romans. I'm going to tell you right now that it is a meaty book. It's a challenging book. It's going to make us stop and think. My prayer is that that thinking moves us to a place of evaluation and ultimately to transformation. So we're going to be picking up today in Romans 3, verses 21 through 31. We're going to be talking about the glory of Christ's salvation. The glory of Christ's salvation. If you are alert and you're awake, type glory in the chat so I know that you're there. So I can tell that you are paying attention and that you are tuning in. The main idea in our text today is we're going to be talking about right standing with God and how it can only come through faith in Jesus's atoning work. We're going to look only at a few verses, but I hope you're hungry because today's text is nothing but meat after meat after meat of gospel goodness. You know, Paul keeps right on putting more and more theological meat on our plates and we're just going to have to keep chewing. I know in Kenya, one of the things that Gabriel likes to say often is that they keep chewing the word, but... I'm excited that today we're all going to be chewing. Um, For those of you who are new in your walk with God, it's okay. You know, we're going to have a very theological discussion today. But theology, it really boils down to the study and the nature of God. It's scriptural, doctrinal beliefs. And so sometimes we make it sound so heavy and we make it sound so complex. But it's really us talking about God. Who is God? What do we have in God? Our relationship with God. So in today's text, we're going to find some of the most important truths in the Bible concerning the nature of salvation. When we're looking in Romans, as we've seen these last few weeks, it's laying the foundation of our faith. You know, we've been speaking on Romans 1 verses 18 through chapter 3 and 20. And what we saw is that we are great sinners. We are great sinners. And now Romans 3, 21 through 26, we're going to learn about the greatness of Christ's saving work on behalf of sinners. So in the beginning, 118 through 320, we were talking about the universal human problem of sin. It gets exposed. Now we're going to be looking at the universal human problem and how it is solved. It is solved in Christ Jesus. And so I've been doing a lot of research on Romans and I have found many theologians who say that it is one of the most important books of the Bible when it comes to understanding the gospel. And when we're looking at verses 21 and 26, it is thought of as being some of the most important verses in the entire book of Romans. You know, Martin Luther said, that today's text is the chief point and the very central place of the epistle and the whole Bible. Theologian Morris says it's it's possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. And he's talking about history. Then C.E.B. Cranfield calls the passage the center and heart of the whole letter. Theologian Bird calls it the epicenter of the gospel. So what we have today is a theological feast. So I hope you are hungry. We're going to be feasting on some mega themes today of the saving righteousness of God. And we're going to be looking at this through the lens of salvation. And Paul speaks of it through the lens of justification. And we've talked about the courts and we've looked at the law. We're going to talk about it through redemption. And how that applies in the marketplace. How are we going to talk about it through perpetuation? And that's using the image of sacrifice. And then we're going to talk about grace and faith and so much more. We're going to be bringing all this down to the point where we understand that the gospel is so good news. It's such good news. It's mighty good news. Some people have even said it's too good to be true news. But we have to know the news, understand the news, and apply the news. And so we're going to look at Jesus' atoning work on behalf of sinners under six headings today. We're going to look at it through intervention, justification, redemption, perpetuation, demonstration, and implication. It should be on your screen. I'm going to give you a minute to jot those down or take a picture. And don't be consumed or concerned if you don't know what some of these things mean. I'm going to explain them as we walk through the text today. But we're going to look at it through six pillars. 
sixth pillar. So let's start reading Romans 3, 21 through 31. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. But there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as perpetuation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Verse 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So the first thing we're going to do as we're looking at verse 21, part A, as we're going into this text, we're going to look at it through the lens of intervention. When you think of the word intervention, it's the act of interfering with the outcome or course, especially of a condition or process. It's to prevent harm. It's to improve functioning. And so when we're going into the text, verse 21A, that's what we're looking at. Paul jumps right in, in this text with two sweet words. And those two sweet words are, but now. That's a mighty good place to praise the Lord. That's a mighty good place to say thank you, Jesus, because that but now lets us know something's about to change. After Paul has described humanity's dreadful condition, he gives us this glorious hope because God has done something on behalf of sinners. God intervened to rescue us from the wrath that was to come. Verse 21 signifies a historical shift in the salvation story, but now something changes. God's saving power has invaded the world through the Messiah. What we're seeing is this, but now the life, the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, it changed everything. The world stood waiting for God's judgment, but now Christ has appeared on the scene and everything changed. This, but now signifies God's gracious intervention. We were losing in this thing, but now we have victory. Our situation has been reversed. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He he paid a price we couldn't pay. And what happens is we see this because God intervened through Jesus Christ and he gave hope to a sinful humanity. If you are grateful that God called an intervention for you, put it in the chat. Type intervention. Let me know that you're glad that Jesus intervened on your behalf. Oh my God, what would have happened if we'd have been left to our own devices? We would have been forever separated from God. But now Jesus appeared on the scene. The second pillar that we look at is justification. The definition of justification is the change in a person's condition, moving from a state of sin to a state of grace and righteousness. Let me repeat that. Justification. The change in a person's condition, moving from a state of sin to a state of grace and righteousness. Once again, this important theme of righteousness is appearing in Romans. You know, the Greek root behind righteousness and justification is found throughout the book of Romans. It's repeated over and over again. So when you study it out and you start circling those words, you see that's a theme here. That we need to spend some time understanding. So as we're looking at this text and as we're looking at the situation as Paul is speaking, there's a question that comes up. The question is, how can someone be right with God? How do you get right with God? They're talking about the law. They're talking about works. They're talking about faith. But we see the answer right here in these verses. You get right with God by faith in Christ. We are put right before God when we are justified, when we are giving righteousness that we cannot earn through a sacrifice that we could not pay, through a gift that we didn't deserve. That's how you get right with God. It's by faith in Christ. You know, Wayne Grudem defines justification as this. 
He says justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he think of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. And number two, he declares us to be righteous in his sight. I want to remix that because Pastor Wayne did a great job, but I need a little bit of KBS, KBS flavor on that. And my remix of that is God is our judge. We all sit before him and he declares only those in Christ to be in the right. That's Romans 4, 22. He, if you're not in Christ, you're not right. In order to be in righteous standing with God, you have to be right with Christ. You have to believe. If you put your faith in Jesus, God declares that you are forgiven, you are acquitted, and you're put in a right relationship with him based on what Christ has done through his sinless life, his death, and his resurrection. You know, justified people have a new status. Justified people have a new identity. Justified people have a new family, and we have a new hope that we get to enjoy as new creations in Christ. We get a different narrative. I want us to walk a little bit further. In verse 21, Paul says the righteousness of God has been revealed in Jesus. In verse 22, he says that righteousness has been given to us. That is, God has provided a righteousness for sinners through their faith in Christ. He keeps walking in verses 25 and 26. He goes on to say that the cross, excuse me, the cross shows God's righteous character. The character of God is righteous and our salvation is about being declared righteous before him through Jesus. The righteousness of Jesus becomes the righteousness of us when we receive faith. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Job 2, he asked this question. Job's like, how can a person be justified before God? The answer is the gospel. Only through what Jesus accomplished on our behalf can we achieve right standing before God. It's not about you. It's not about your education. It's not about what you have. It's about who you have. What you choose to believe and what you choose to receive. What Jesus clearly stated in verse 21 is that this righteousness is apart from the law. The saving righteousness that we are talking about, that we get, that puts us in right standing before God is received by faith, not by the law. I want to go back a little bit. You know, you need to understand why you need this God saving righteousness. Verse 23 says, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All means all. You know, Paul is kind of connecting the previous verses in chapters 1, 18 and 3 through 20, where he's reminding us about how every single person is a sinner. We're all falling short. We all miss God's standard. Verse 22 tells us there's no distinction. And I want you to get this. We're not a little naughty or a little messed up. We fell short. We fall short. That is why we need God's saving righteousness. It's not a little bit of sin. Or big sin, little sin. It's all sin. It's all sin. And the only solution to the sin problem is the Jesus solution. You know, the phrase apart from the law in verse 21 and apart from the works of the law in verse 28 show us that right standing with God cannot be earned. It's not based on doing good works. It's not based on following rules. It's not. None of that can save you. Church attendance can't save you. I had a conversation with a 68 or 69 year old woman yesterday. I can't remember which one it was. And she said she'd been in church her whole life until two years ago when she got saved. She says, I was a member, but they weren't teaching about salvation. I've been in church my whole life. But two years ago, she ended up at a church that started teaching and she realized she didn't have a relationship. And she realized without a relationship, she was lost. And she gave her life to Christ. And she sat in my office with tears coming down her face because two years ago, she didn't even understand this. And she's almost 70. What we have to grasp is that the spirit of legalism crushes people. Legalism kills people. Legalism is a false gospel. The law shows us that we need a savior. You can't do it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Even on your best day. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. And we need to get that in our heads. We need to let go of the works mentality. Is there work that you need to be doing? Absolutely. We should be serving God in word and deed, but it's not your works that save you. 
You know, this passage is teaching us the important truth that salvation is received by faith in Christ alone. Christ, who was perfectly faithful, perfectly righteous, that's how we walk into it. I want you to look at verse 22. It says once again, to all who believe. Look at that. Circle it in your Bible. Highlight it on your Bible app. Your Bible app. It's to all who believe. If you don't believe, if you don't receive Jesus, if you're not in Jesus and Jesus is not in you and you don't have a relationship, you are not saved. You know, when you look at this, this verse is repeated. Excuse me. These lines are repeated in verses 25 through 28. Verses 30 is letting us know that, wait a minute, I'm not speaking of a generic faith. I'm not talking about you have faith. I'm talking of a specific faith. Paul is speaking of a very specific faith that's in the person of Jesus Christ. It's a faith in the person of Jesus Christ. We're not put in right standing before God by working for God, but by trusting in the Savior and receiving the finished work. Receiving this work that verse 24 lets us know it's a gift. Paul is teaching us that justification comes as a gift. It's given freely, but we have to receive it the same way as a gift. I want to put a pin here for a minute. You need to get this. And I know I'm speaking a foreign language to some of you, which is why I told you to get your Bible. Don't take my word for it. I want you to study this for yourself. Salvation is not about trying harder. Salvation is not about doing more. It's about receiving God's grace and being transformed. Justification is rooted in God's undeserved favor bestowed upon us. It ain't about you, boo. It's about him. It's not about you. It's about what Jesus did on your behalf. And when you grasp that thing, when you understand that it's all about grace, your response will be, I want to do better. As much as he loves me, I, I want to be better. It's not to earn his love. It's the reality that I've got his love. So I'm responding to that love. I received his grace. So I'm responding to that grace. And I want to live a life that honors him and reflects who he is. You just take a deep breath. Whew, this is a lot. I know. I'm coming fast. I'm coming hard. I encourage you. Go back and listen to this, you know, a couple of times. Sit still and pray through this text because I want the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. I want to give you the information in the backdrop, but he has to teach you. The next pillar that I want us to talk about is redemption. Redemption is the work of Christ on our behalf, whereby he purchases us. He ransoms us as the, at the price of his own life. He secures our deliverance from the bondage and condemnation of sin. That's what redemption is. We need redemption because we were weak and helpless. And you don't believe me? Let's look back at the book of Exodus. You know, the people of Israel were enslaved to Egypt. They were under political, economic, social, and spiritual slavery. They needed to be redeemed. They needed to be redeemed. The price of redemption included the sacrificial lamb and deliverance from Egypt. They're bound together. We have freedom from bondage through the death of Jesus, the Passover sacrificial lamb. I don't have time to go back and teach Exodus 6, but there's a connection here. In the New Testament, Paul saying that we're bought with the price. The atoning blood was shed to purchase our freedom. Jesus' death is the ransom that paid it all for us. It's the payment that makes us family. You know, in Exodus 6 and 7, God calls Israel his son. He told Moses the goal of the redeeming work was this. I think it's Exodus 6 and 7. It says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God. Redemption and covenant relationship go together. They go together. The redeemed are the adopted. We become brothers and sisters in the household of God. We become family. You know, when I taught the book of Mark, I think one of uh, Maurice's favorite lessons is when I talked about the family of God. He who does the will of the Father is my family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. The blood that joins us is the blood of Jesus. It may not be DNA of your family, but the blood of Jesus. I had a, an, a great aunt share something with me. And she said, you know, there's a difference between family and kinfolk. You know, she said, surround yourself with family. And sometimes you got to leave kinfolk alone. Your family is those who, who believe like you believe, who serve like you serve. You love everybody. But you build your life around those people who are your family. 
So we're going to get to the next pillar. And this pillar today is perpetuation. Say perpetuation. People teach about that all the time. And you hear that word thrown around in church. But if you don't understand what it means, this is your time. When you think about perpetuation, it is literally the word that talks about us avoiding the wrath of God by Jesus being offered up as the perfect sacrifice. It's the turning away of the wrath of God as the just judgment of our sins by God's own provision of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Perpetuation is when we talk about he paid it all. All to him I owe. You know, sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. That word perpetuation is talking about that. As we are looking at these verses, Paul continues to tell us that our salvation was paid for by Christ's propitiatory sacrifice. He says that God puts Christ forward as a perpetuation. When you look at the ESV, when you're looking at the CSV version, it says the mercy seat by his blood. He put him forth. This is saying, wait a minute. Christ was put forth publicly. His death was not hidden away in some corner. His death was out on view for everybody to see. He put it forward. His death was sacrificial. And it was more than just a physical sacrifice. This death appeased the righteous wrath of God. That's where perpetuation come from, comes from. The son bore the penalty from God, for, from God and paid the price that the sinners owe to God. His death involved a severe substitution. He wasn't there for us. He was there instead of us. Jesus didn't hang on the cross for you. He hung there instead of you. We belonged on that cross. But Jesus says, wait a minute, I'll do it. I'll do it. And because he did it, we're now reconciled to God and the wrath of God has been turned away and we are now a part of his family. We've been adopted into the family. I don't care if you were raised an orphan or if you were abandoned by your family or you're rejected by your family. It doesn't matter. You're not an orphan. You're a son. You're not an orphan anymore. You're a daughter because of Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice. So next, I want to get to the next pillar, and that's demonstration. You know, that's a little more familiar term, but when we talk about demonstration in this text, we're talking about the proving of a truth principle. The proving of a truth principle. I want you to get that in salvation, God declares unrighteous people righteous through faith in Christ's atoning work, through the payment of what Jesus did on the cross. This salvation not only involves a declaration of righteousness, but it involves a demonstration of God's righteousness. I want you to look at verse 25, part B of that. It says that in God, in his divine forbearance, he passed over the sins previously committed. He passed over the sins that were already done. So then this question becomes, how can a holy God accept sinful men and women without violating his justice? How does he, how does he uphold his character when these people have sinned? The answer is simple. It's the cross. At the cross, God upholds his just character and he accepts sinners as righteous before him. The cross literally solidifies God as both the judge and the justifier. He's both. He's both. The cross did that for us. The, the love demonstrated on the cross, the, the sacrifice demonstrated on the cross showed that, yes, he's a just God. But he allowed himself to be the justifier. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. We're coming around the rear. We're coming around the rear. I want to talk about the, the last, one of the last ones, implications. What is implications? Implications is the conclusion that can be drawn from something. When you look at verses 27 through 31, we see that. We see Paul literally moving from an explanation to implications after he's viewed the gospel from a various of angles. You know, Paul's a good preacher, so he's twisting this thing around a thousand different directions so that people can get it. Okay, I'm going to send it to you this way. Okay, I'm going to show it to you this way. I'm going to paint a picture this way because he wanted to make sure that they got it. But what we're seeing now is he's shifting in verse 27 and he's addressing the heart and our relationships in light of the gospel truths that we've talked about. What we see in verse 27 is we see him being humble. We see that humility and not boasting is the, is the way we're supposed to be. Verses 28 through 31, we literally go from we're not supposed to be boasting to seeing unity in the message of salvation being both for the Jew 
and the Gentiles. So as we look at these verses, we get a few points I want to conclude with. You know, the good news should humble us. We didn't earn salvation. We didn't earn righteousness. Even on your good day, you're not good enough. You need Jesus. The good news should humble us. The good news is the basis for our Christian unity. Look at verses 28 through 31. We should be unified with brothers and sisters because of the good news. It's the gospel. We may not agree on everything, but the gospel. We may not see eye to eye. It's the gospel. Can we sit on the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has purchased, what his sacrifice meant for us? The good news is the reason we should be unified. I know we got a thousand different denominations. We got all these things and all these people who have perspectives. At the end of the day, what does the gospel say? We need to leave our opinions alone and our thoughts and our theories alone. What does the gospel say? We just need to teach and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the third concluding point is the good news allows us to rest in the grace of Jesus Christ. Rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The, the children of Israel didn't eat the, enter into the promised land because they didn't enter into the rest of God. So as I'm studying about this gospel, as I'm studying about you know, righteousness, as I'm studying and deep diving Romans, God is just challenging me to rest in what he did for me, reminding me that what he did was enough. And if I draw close to him and I'm in alignment with him and I listen for his leading and I'm obedient in what he says, then I can rest in what he's done. That's relationship. That's relationship. And I, I hope today's lesson has encouraged you because we can all rejoice in the finished work of Christ. Every single one of us should be responding to this by retelling the good news to the world. Your world is your family. Your world is your job. Your world is your church. Your world is your community. Your world is your social media. Whatever it is that you have to speak, whatever space God puts you in, that's your world. Share the good news. You don't need a pulpit. I'm not sitting in a pulpit right now. You don't need a, a platform. You just need to be where people are. And your life should retell the good news. And then I want you to allow the good news to humble you as you unite with other believers. You know, we're designed to do life together. We're supposed to be in relationship one with another. The church is supposed to be the body of believers. And we should be reflecting that and be connected to that. You're up close and personal. This is one for me. Why is the phrase, but now, so important to this text? And why should it be important to you? Write that down. Why is the phrase, but now, so important in this text? What shifted? What changed? What narrative went a different direction? And why should it be important to you on today? I am so excited that you have tuned in. That was a lot of word, I know. If you want to join us in the, the Zoom room class discussion, I want you to see the information in the chat or on the screen for how to get in and join us. We just take that time to deep dive this a little bit more. We talk, we ask questions, we pray. So if you want to join us, know that you are welcome. Hop on in. If you're enjoying our Saturday morning walks, I ask that you share this link with a friend. Share it on your social media page. Let's grow up in Jesus together. And lastly, if you desire to sow a seed, please see the ways that you can give to support local and global missions on the screen. You know, we are excited about Bethel. You know, tomorrow morning, they're going to be in their new facility. We're so grateful for the partners who are working with us so that we can contribute to that. I'm excited to send another seed next week toward that. You know, we um, did the down payment on the windows, but there's still more to be paid. And there are a few other things we need to do. However, we're not stopping moving forward. They're going to be in the building in the morning. I'm excited about that. We have work going on here on the first Sunday in September. We're working diligently for Awaken to be in the building. Stay tuned for information about that. God is moving. He is moving. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. And so we're excited that you are partnering with us, that you are praying with us, and that you're supporting the efforts that we're doing. So I'm so grateful that you're here. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy. We thank you for this text that teaches us and feeds us on how to walk this thing out. God, we thank you for the but now, how you intervened. You split time in half to come rescue us and to redeem us. And then you sacrificed your best on our behalf. God, may we live in response to that sacrifice. May we live lives of gratitude and joy. 
May we rest in what you finished. Yeah, there are a lot of things we may not understand and things that may not be going the way we want to want them to go, but we have so much to be grateful for. God, we, if we don't even know what to say thank you for, how about we can start with saying thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for him hanging there in our place and purchasing our healing, giving us benefits, giving us authority. And then when he, when he got up out of that grave, he gave us the keys to the kingdom. So we have binding and loosing power because of Jesus. So God, I pray right now that we exercise that and I pray for those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that are struggling, be it financially, emotionally, relationally. God, whatever their need is today, God, you meet them right where you are because your word is true. And every promise that you've made to us is yes and amen in Jesus. And we've been reminded today of the glory of his finished work, the power and the benefits of his finished work. And God, we lay claim to those benefits as sons and daughters who've been adopted into your family. We're kingdom kids, God, and for that we say thank you. God, we pray for the kids that are returning to school. We pray for staff and educators. God, we pray that you just be in the midst of all the transitioning that's happening. God, there's so much happening around the world. There is so much unrest. God, I thank you that even in all of that, you are God and you're God alone. So right now, God, I just speak a blessing into every person who's tuned in. I speak your perfect will being done, God, in areas of our lives that we are not doing what we need to do, that we may be falling short and missing it. Convict us. God, we want to be better. When we're slipping, when we are justifying wrong behavior, when we've adopted things that oppose you as normal and natural, and we make excuses for it. God, if we're your kids and we have a relationship, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are receptive to correction. Because our desire is to be like you and to be more like you and to reflect you. And we can't do that if we're living raggedy. We can't do that if our lives are reeked with sin and we're not repentant over our wrong actions. Help us, Holy Spirit, where we're struggling. God, help us to be bold enough to, to ask for help or to get some accountability on those things that we're where we're dancing with the devil instead of living in the divine. Those barriers, those open doors that we are giving the enemy access into our lives, into our worlds, into our families. God, help us to be bold and brave and courageous enough to shut them. God, we're reminded today of the power of your gospel. And we want that gospel flowing and growing and transforming us from the inside out. And God, we know that begins with a surrendered heart and mind. So Lord, we, we thank you in advance for how you're moving, how you're teaching and what you're doing. And God, I pray that you're writing this word on our hearts and on our minds and on our lives so that when we tend to forget or when we start to drift, it snatches us back into position. God, we wanna live in right alignment with you. We want to live as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus into every area of our lives. And we need your help. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that it is well, it is so, it is done, it is finished. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Next week, we're going to be picking up and it's going to be an exciting lesson. It's meaty. Yes, it's more meat, so come prepared to chew. So until next time. And until next Saturday, I just want to challenge you to do you on max in Jesus. God bless.